The start of the New York City Marathon. 100 women are competing in this traditionally male event. Ahead are 26 grueling miles through the streets of New York. Today, sport for women is entering a new era. More women are taking part than ever before, overcoming centuries of prejudice against the physically active woman and myths about her lack of strength and endurance. From earliest times, men have fostered a myth that has stood in the way of women's participation in sport. The myth of feminine weakness. Aristotle, 4th century BC. The author of nature gave man strength of body and boldness of mind to enable him to face great hardships. And to woman was given a weak and delicate constitution accompanied by a natural softness and timidity which fit her for sedentary life. In contrast to Aristotle's belief is the evidence from his own time of women engaged in vigorous activity. Including the Amazons, reputed to be fierce warriors. Almost every historical period provides surprising images of physically active women. In the Middle Ages, women were almost as much addicted to outdoor sport as men. Coming closer to our own time, women showed extraordinary physical and mental fortitude in the struggle to survive on the American frontier. In the 19th century, the weaker sex endured long hours of drudgery in factories. Although considered too frail for hard work, they were hired because their labor was cheap. Still not fully recognized is the reality of women's strength and stamina. In the 19th century, a woman of the upper and middle class was the opposite of today's sportswoman. Sport is active, she was passive, confined to home in the care of children, an increasingly subordinate role. The ideal woman of the Victorian era was admired for paleness and delicacy. Such standards were not conducive to good health. The importance of exercise had not been fully recognized. I love feeling that my body is in its best condition. It's just a, a celebration of life when you have that control. As women began attending college in the mid-19th century, a question was seriously raised. 
Can women endure the physical effort requisite for a regular old-fashioned college course? Can the female constitution bear the long strain? Too much study would lead to curvature of the spine. Prevention was possible through proper exercise. Calisthenics. This was the appropriate means of keeping women in trim and in their place. As America grew wealthy, the well-to-do and the growing middle class acquired more leisure. Croquet, imported from England in the late 1860s, a sport for both sexes, with opportunities for more than just exercise. Archery met Victorian standards of respectability. The fashions made free movement almost impossible in other sports. A revolution in women's fashions was to come through the growing popularity of the bicycle, 1896. Had it not been for the extraordinary vogue which bicycling has had for the past two years, we should still be wearing hoops. Feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton rejoiced in the new sport. Many a woman is riding to suffrage on a bicycle. Women were awakening very slowly to the pleasures of physical exercise. idea that I could even run five miles, let alone 26, is just an incredible experience for me. Smith College in Mount Holyoke introduced basketball in 1892. College girls loved the game. Their teachers were concerned about the girls becoming rowdy, out of control. Experiments in this new game of basketball show that a modification is necessary to guard against over-fatigue and its dangerous consequences. Special rules for girls' basketball were drawn up, dividing the court into areas out of which girls could not move. The purpose? To keep them from becoming exhausted. century, bathing costumes were brief enough to encourage not merely bathing, but swimming. The breaststroke, considered the most suitable for women. Early films show women at the water's edge, acting with Victorian restraint. These kinetoscope pictures were intended mainly for male peep show entertainment. They document a contemporary attitude. An active woman was thought to be foolish. Those who were filmed obliged by performing foolishly.
1904 news event, a physical culture contest in New York City. A strong physique was obviously the basis for choosing the male winner. The winner among the women. What drew women to sport, increasing its popularity, was that they could participate with the opposite sex and still be considered womanly, attractive, and even fashionable. In the decade before World War I, the suffrage movement had made substantial headway, awakening women politically, intellectually, and physically. Colleges, large crowds turned out for the big game. There was a new, lively interest in being on the team. But the momentum in sports, like the drive for the vote, was interrupted by World War I. A few women were accepted in the Navy and Marines, no longer comic figures as they clambered over an obstacle course designed for men. After the war, women won the vote at last, but the feminist movement, temporarily without a goal, lost its force. As an aftermath of the war, Physical fitness for men was considered patriotic. Men's athletics rose to new heights of importance. Meanwhile, women's colleges emphasized formal instruction in sports rather than competition. A few colleges sponsored field hockey, which made tremendous physical demands and drew disapproval. The lingering Victorian viewpoint reported in the New York Times, 1921. Every girl, it seems, has a large store of vital and nervous energy upon which to draw in the great crisis of motherhood. If the foolish virgin uses up this deposit in daily expenditures on the hockey field or tennis court, as a boy can afford to, then she is left bankrupt in her great crisis, and her children have to pay the bill. the Jazz Age, signified a total rejection of Victorian notions of womanhood. Women proved themselves as foolhardy as men, and just as classy. The anti-Victorian mood set the stage for a mushrooming of interest in women's sports. One personality moved her generation into sport as no one had before. 1926, Gertrude Ederly, the first woman to swim the English Channel. Her time for the 20-mile swim from France to England broke the existing record for men. When she came home, suffragist Carrie Chapman Catt hailed her achievement as an historic victory for feminism. 
a woman athlete who proved a model for other women had appeared for the first time. Thousands of enthusiasts practiced to learn the crawl. Companies put up large sums for winners of marathon swimming contests for women. The woman athlete had won national attention and respect. Another heroine of the 20s, Amelia Earhart. First woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, she believed the sky was a challenge for women as it was for men. I hope for the day when women will know no restrictions because of sex. In 1938, Amelia Earhart charted a courageous flight across the Pacific and disappeared. The note she left for her husband read, Please know I am quite aware of the hazards. Women must try to do things as men have tried. Given the opportunity, women did try to prove themselves. Being on the crew in college had at one time required a good singing voice, for the crew would row to a pleasant spot to sing together. Now rowing began to be taken more seriously. But most colleges encouraged the gentler forms of activity. The role of the co-ed in sport was principally that of spectator as depicted in a movie of the 30s. Come on, Don! Come on, Don! sport long considered appropriate for women was becoming more popular and more competitive. Another inspiring model for women, Helen Wills Moody, number one in tennis for seven years. From 1927 to 1932, she didn't lose a single set. One of the great women athletes of the first half of the century, she was surpassed by few others. One was Babe Didrikson Zaharias, a top athlete in track events as varied as sprints, broad jump, and the javelin throw. America has never had as outstanding a woman athlete in so many fields of sport. The 30s brought to prominence Sonia Haney, who was the first woman to attain movie stardom through sport. The route for most women was still the pretty face and figure. World War II brought large numbers of women into the armed services and into physical fitness programs. The war changed attitudes toward women's physical capabilities as they filled jobs previously reserved for men. Also, women in industry became more interested in what had been considered male sports. Gone were the rules which limited free movement on the basketball court. Not a sport in the true sense, the roller derby was nevertheless an aggressive battle that drew large audiences to watch fast action, spills and brawls. Clearly, women could take it.
prejudice about race, like myths about women, dies slowly. Althea Gibson helped to topple the Lily White tradition in tennis by winning the National and Wimbledon Championships in 1957 and 58. The changing attitudes toward women in sport can best be seen in the history of the Olympic Games. At the time the modern Olympics began in 1896, male opposition was intense. Founder of the Games, Baron de Coubertin. We feel that the Olympic Games must be reserved for men. We must continue to try to achieve the following definition. The solemn and periodic exaltation of male athleticism with internationalism as a base, art or its setting, and female applause as reward. This is 1932, when women were active participants. Wilma Rudolph, who won three gold medals in the 1960 Olympics, is one in a long line of distinguished black athletes. In 1972, a woman entering her fifth Olympics led the American delegation. Olga Fichtova Connolly carried the flag. I carried it high as I could. I caught a glimpse of other flag bearers who were large men. So I gripped the flag in one hand just like the men. I thought that in order to make the flag of the United States as beautiful as I wanted to see it, we needed not only strong men, but also strong women. Men continue to resist women's entrance into sports they consider exclusively male. Male jockeys boycotted the first race in which Barbara Jo Rubin had been entered. The crowd disapproved the boycott. Hostility continues, but women jockeys have broken through old barriers to establish a new role for women in professional horse racing. Another breakthrough in Little League Baseball. In 1974, legal suits against discrimination resulted in court orders to allow girls to play. Women's success in professional tennis led retired champion Bobby Riggs to claim he could beat the best of the women players. In a much publicized match staged in 1973, he defeated Margaret Court. In the following year, with even more fanfare, Riggs challenged Billie Jean King. The contest would be watched on television by millions. And she says she's gonna scrape me off the court of the Astrodrome, and I claim it's gonna be her they're gonna scrape off. So that's what it's all about, and it is gonna be the battle of the sexes. Don't anybody let you tell you it's any different. King outclassed Riggs, winning in three straight sets. Women can be great athletes, and I think you'll find in the next decade, women athletes will finally get the attention that they've deserved through the years that people will respect us as athletes and not just whether we're good looking and whether she's cute. We're changing.
The goal of women is not necessarily to compete with men or to adopt their attitudes towards sport. Women may choose to reject a male sport ethic that often accepts violence and commercialization. But one thing is certain. Women are no longer content to be mere spectators. Nor will they continue to cast themselves in secondary roles, drumming up enthusiasm for male athletes. Today, women are demanding their share of funds to support athletics in their schools and colleges. In the arena of sport, women have been outsiders for too long. Today, they are gaining admission. The feminist movement has had a powerful impact, creating an awareness of rights and new enthusiasm for sport. Women want all the rewards that sport can offer. The joy of performance, the satisfaction of striving, and all the lessons to be learned from competing with others. We want the discipline of training, the exhilaration of achievement, and recognition for our skills and talents. And we want to experience the beauty, power, and grace that sport offers everyone.